decisions would have to be made based on their secondary characteristics, availability, hypergolicity, smoothness of combustion, toxicity, and so on. The one important exception was hydrazine. Not the hydrazine hydrate the Germans had been using, but anhydrous N. 2. H. 4. Dave Horvitz, at RMI, fired the hydrate with oxygen in 1950, but I am not aware of any other experiments, in this country at least, in which it was involved. Almost all the hydrazine hydrate looted from Germany was converted to the anhydrous base before being distributed for testing. One method of conversion was to reflux the hydrate over barium oxide, and then to distill over the anhydrous hydrazine under reduced pressure. Hydrazine was hypergolic with the prospective oxidizers, it had a high density for a fuel, 1.004, and its performance was definitely better than those of the other prospective fuels. But, its freezing point was 1.50 C higher than that of water, and it cost almost $20 a pound. So two things obviously had to be done get the price of hydrazine down, and somehow, lower the freezing point. And again, there was that haunting thought of pantaverane. There was one subject on which everybody agreed. Nobody was going to put up with the aniline RFNA combination for one moment longer than he had to. The acid was so corrosive to anything you wanted to make propellant tanks out of that it had to be loaded into the missile just before firing, which meant handling it in the field. And when poured it gives off dense clouds of highly poisonous no. 2. And the liquid itself produces dangerous and extremely painful burns when it touches the human hide and but nitric acid and the struggle to domesticate it deserve, and will get, a chapter all to themselves. The aniline is almost as bad, but a bit more subtle in its actions. If a man is spashed generously with it, and it isn't removed immediately, he usually turns purple and then blue and is likely to die of cyanosis in a matter of minutes. So the combination was understandably unpopular, and the call went out for a new one that was, at least, not quite so poisonous and miserable to handle. Kaplan and Borden at JPL suggested one at the beginning of 1946. This was WFNA and straight furfuryl alcohol. Furfuryl alcohol was about as harmless as any propellant was likely to be, and WFNA. The hunting of the hypergol. 27. While it was just as corrosive as RFNA, and was just as hard on the anatomy, at least didn't give off those clouds of no. 2. They fired the combination in a whack corporal motor, comparing it to the 20% furfuryl alcohol, 80% aniline mixture and RFNA, and found no measurable difference in performance between the two systems. The whack corporal was conceived as a sounding rocket, the little sister to the 20,000 pound thrust corporal then under development. It was the ancestor of the aerobie. And, as a bonus, they found that ignition was fast and smooth, and much more tolerant to water in the acid than was the corporal combination. At about the same time, RMI was making a similar set of tests. These were all run in a 220 pound thrust Lark motor, whose mixed acid, monoethylanolin combination was the reference propellant system. They used three fuels 80 octane gasoline, furfuryl alcohol, and turpentine, and three types of nitric acid oxidizer mixed acid, WFNA, and RFNA containing 15% N. 2. O. 4. Asterisk they used a hypergolic starting slug on the gasoline firings, and rather surprisingly, got good results with all three acids. Perforyl alcohol was no good with mixed acid. The combination was smoky and messy. And the reaction of the sulfuric acid of the ma with the alcohol produced a weird collection of tars, cokes, and resins, which quite clogged up the motor. But furfuryl alcohol was excellent with RFNA and WFNA, starting considerably smoother than did their reference propellants. 
and Turpentine gave hard starts with RFNA and WFNA, but with Ma started off like a fire hose. So that was one of the two combinations that they preferred. The other was Furfuril Alcohol and WFNA. The RFNA performed a little better, but those no. 2. Fumes. Although neat furfuril alcohol freezes at 31 degrees C rather too high for comfort. Many other fuels were tried during the late 40s and early 50s. At JPL mixtures of aniline with ethanol or with isopropanol were investigated and burned with RFNA. Ammonia was fired there, with RFNA, as early as 1949, and the next year Cole and Foster fired it with N. 2. Oh. Four. The M.W. Kellogg co-burned it with WFNA, and by 1951, R.J. Thompson of that company was beating the drum for this combination as the workhorse propellant for all occasions. Reaction Motors experimented with mixtures of ammonia and methylamine. I.O. reduced the vapor pressure of the ammonia, and showed that the addition of 1.5% of decaborine made ammonia hypergolic with WFNA, while the Bendix Corp, in 1953, showed that the same. Asterisk interestingly enough, the first stage of Diamond, which put the first French satellite into orbit, burns turpentine and RFNA. 28. Ignition. And could be achieved by flowing the ammonia over lithium wire just upstream of the injector. JPL fired various oddities with RFNA, such as furfural and two methylated and partially reduced pyridines, tetrapyre, and pentaprim. The object of these tests is not readily apparent, nor is the reason why RMI bothered to fire cyclic tetraene with WFNA. The fuel is not only expensive and hard to get, but it has a very high freezing point and has nothing in particular to recommend it. And the reason that the Naval Air Rocket Test Station went to the trouble of burning ethylene oxide with WFNA is equally baffling. The Edisonian approach has much to recommend it, but can be run into the ground. One of the oddest combinations to be investigated was tried by RMI, who burned D-Limonene with WFNA. D-Limonene is a terpene which can be extracted from the skins of citrus fruits, and all during the runs the test area was blanketed with a delightful odor of lemon oil. The contrast with the odors of most other rocket propellants makes the event worth recording. Oh. It had long since become obvious to everybody concerned that firing a combination in a rocket motor is not the ideal way to find out whether or not it is hypergolic and, if it is, how fast it ignites. By the nature of research more tests are going to fail than are going to succeed, and more combinations are going to ignite slowly than are going to light off in a hurry. And when the result of each delayed ignition is a demolished motor, a screening program can become a bit tedious and more than a bit expensive. So the initial screening moved from the test stand into the laboratory, as various agencies built themselves ignition delay apparatus of one sort or another. Most of these devices were intended not only to determine whether or not a combination was hypergolic, but also to measure the ignition delay if it was. In construction they varied wildly, the designs being limited only by the imagination of the investigator. The simplest tester consisted of an eyedropper, a small beaker, and a finely calibrated eyeball and the most complicated was practically a small rocket motor setup. And there was everything in between. One of the fancier rigs was conceived by my immediate boss, Paul Turlitzi, at Nards. He wanted to take high speech Learin, Shadow, movies of the ignition process. What information he thought they would provide escaped me at the time, and still does. Asterisk there was a small IG. Asterisk an incurable inventor of acronyms, he called it STIDA, for Schlieren type ignition delay apparatus. The hunting of the Hypergol 29. Nishan chamber, with high speed valves and injectors for the propellants under investigation. Viewing ports, a high speed fast X camera, and about 40 pounds of lenses, prisms, and whatnot, most of them salvaged from German submarine periscopes, 
completed the setup. Dr. Milton Shear, Uncle Milty, labored over the thing for weeks, getting all the optics lined up and focused. Came the day of the first trial. The propellants were hydrazine and WFNA. We were all gathered around waiting for the balloon to go up, when Uncle Milty warned, hold it the acid valve is leaking. Go ahead fire anyway. Paul ordered. <coughs> I looked around and signaled to my own gang, and we started backing gently away, like so many cats with wet feet. Howard Strame opened his mouth to protest, but as he said later, I saw that dojating grin on Doc's face and shut it again, and somebody pushed the button. There was a little flicker of yellow flame, and then a brilliant blue-white flash and an ear-splitting crack. The lid to the chamber went through the ceiling, we found it in the attic some weeks later, the viewports vanished. And some 40 pounds of high-grade optical glass was reduced to a fine powder before I could blink. I clasped both hands over my mouth and staggered out of the lab, to collapse on the lawn and laugh myself sick, and Paul stalked out in a huff. When I tottered weakly back into the lab some hours later I found that my gang had sought out, carried away, and carefully lost, some four feet from the middle of the table on which the gadget had rested. So that Paul Stitter could never, never, never be reassembled, in our lab. Other agencies had their troubles with ignition delay apparatus, although their experiences weren't often as spectacular as ours, but I hey eventually started cranking out results. Not too surprisingly, no two laboratories got the same numbers, and from 1945 until 1955 one would be hard put to find a period when there wasn't a cooperative ignition delay program going on. As the various laboratories I lied to reconcile their results. One of the difficulties was that the different testers varied widely in the speed and the efficiency with which they mixed the two reactants. And another lay in the fact that different criteria for ignition were used by various experimenters. One might take the first appearance of flame, as shown by a photo CRLL or an ionization gauge or a high-speed camera, as the moment of ignition, while another, with a micro-motor set up, might take the moment at which his motor arrived at full thrust or the design chamber pressure. 30 Ignition But although the various investigators didn't often come up with the same numbers, they generally rated propellant combinations in the same order. While they seldom agreed on the number of milliseconds it took combination A to light off, they were generally in complete agreement that it was a hell of a lot faster than combination B which was enough for many purposes. After all, everybody knew that WFNA and fervoril alcohol were fast enough to live with, and obviously, if something shows up on the tester as faster than that combination it's probably worth trying in a motor. Many laboratories worked in the field but Don Griffin at JPL and Lou Rapp at RMI were early comers in ignition delay work. The former organization, as was natural since Corporal was their baby, did a lot of work on the aniline fervoril alcohol mixture. And in 1948 determined that the mixture with the minimum ignition delay consisted of 60% of the alcohol and 40 of aniline. This was close to the 49 fa 51 aniline eutectic, melting point 43 degrees Celsius, and the corporal fuel, the missile was still under development, was changed from the 20% fa mixture to a 50 to 51. Otherwise, they confirmed the hypergolic reaction of furin compounds and of aromatic amines with nitric acid, and demonstrated the beneficial effect of N. 2. O. 4. In the latter case. And they showed that amines, particularly tertiary amines, and unsaturated compounds were generally hypergolic, while aliphatic alcohols and saturates generally were not. Most of their work was done with nitric acid, but a good deal, from 1948 on, was done with N. 2. O. 4. Whose hypergolic nature generally resembled that of acid. Reaction motors investigated the hypergolicity of similar compounds, 
as well as such things as the furans, vinyl, and allylamines, and polyacetylenics, such as diprop argale, with the skeleton structure. Without the hydrogens, C equals C, 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 G equals C. And they found that many silanes were hypergolic with acid. The University of Texas, in 1948, also worked with these, and showed that 30% of tetralyl silane would make gasoline hypergolic. The University of Texas also investigated the zinc alkyls, as Sanger had done 16 years earlier. Standard Oil of California was the first of the oil companies to get into rocket propellant research in a big way, when Mike Pino, at the company's research arm, California Research, started measuring ignition delays in the fall of 1948. At first his work resembled that of the other workers, as he demonstrated fast ignition with dienes, acetylenics, and allylamines. So, the hunting of the hypergol. 31. Years later, in 1954, Lurap at RMI assembled the results of all the early ignition delay work, and attempted to make some generalizations. His major conclusion was that the ignition of a hydrocarbon or an alcohol involved the reaction of the acid with a double or triple bond. And that if none existed it had to be created before the ignition could take place. Later, in speaking of nitric acid, the plausibility of this postulate will be examined. But then Pino, in 1949, made a discovery that can fairly be described as revolting. He discovered that butyl mercaptan was very rapidly hypergolic with mixed acid. This naturally delighted standard of California, whose crudes contained large quantities of mercaptans and sulfides which had to be removed in order to make their gasoline socially acceptable. So they had drums and drums of mixed butyl mercaptans, and no use for it. If they could only sell it for rocket fuel life would indeed be beautiful. Well. It had two virtues, or maybe three. It was hypergolic with mixed acid, and it had a rather high density for a fuel. And it wasn't corrosive. But its performance was below that of a straight hydrocarbon, and its odor, well, its odor was something to consider. Intense, pervasive, and penetrating, and resembling the stink of an enraged skunk, but surpassing, by far, the best efforts of the most vigorous specimen of Mephitis Mephitis. It also clings to the clothes and the skin. But rocketeers are a hardy breed, and the stuff was duly and successfully fired, although it is rumored that certain rocket mechanics were excluded from their carpools and had to run behind. Ten years after it was fired at the Naval Air Rocket Test Station Nards, the odor was still noticeable around the test areas. And at Nards, with more zeal than judgment, I actually developed an analysis for it. California Research had an extremely posh laboratory at Richmond, on San Francisco Bay, and that was where Pino started his investigations. But when he started working on the Mercaptans, he and his accomplices were exiled to a wooden shack out in the boondocks at least 200 yards from the main building. Undeterred and unrepentant, he continued his noisome endeavors, but it is very much worth noting that their emphasis had changed. His next candidates were not petroleum byproducts, nor were they chemicals which were commercially available. They were synthesized by his own crew, specifically for fuels. Here, at the very beginning of the FIOS, the chemists started taking over from the engineers, synthesizing NCW propellants, which were frequently entirely new compounds, to order. Instead of being content with items off the shelf. Anyhow, he came up with the ethyl mercaptal of acetaldehyde and 32. Ignition. The ethyl mercaptal of acetone with the skeleton structures. C. I. CCSCSCC and CCSCSCC. I. I. CC respectively. The odor of these was not so much skunk-like as garlicky, the epitome and concentrate of all the back doors of all the bad Greek restaurants in all the world. 
and finally he surpassed himself with something that had a dimethylamino group attached to a mercaptan sulfur, and whose odor can't, with all the resources of the English language, even be described. It also drew flies. This was too much, even for Pino and his unregenerate crew, and they banished it to a hole in the ground another 200 yards farther out into the Thule marshes. Some months later, in the dead of night, they surreptitiously consigned it to the bottom of San Francisco Bay. To understand the entry of the next group of workers into the propellant field, it's necessary to go back a bit and pick up another thread. From the beginning, the services had disliked the fuels that the researchers had offered them, not only because of their inherent disadvantages, but above all because they weren't gasoline. They already had gasoline and used huge quantities of it and why should they have to bother with something else? But, as we have seen, gasoline is not a good fuel to burn with nitric acid, and the services had to accept the fact. Which they did, grudgingly. But all through the late 40s and early 50s the Navy and the Air Force were busily changing over from piston airplane engines to turbojets. And they started buying jet fuel instead of gasoline, and the whole thing started all over again. They demanded of the people designing their missiles that said missiles be fueled with jet fuel. Now, what is jet fuel? That depends. A turbojet has a remarkably undiscriminating appetite, and will run, or can be made to run, on just about anything that will burn and can be made to flow, from coal dust to hydrogen. But the services decided, in setting up the specifications for the jet fuel that they were willing to buy, that the most important considerations should be availability and ease of handling. So since petroleum was the most readily available source of thermal energy in the country, and since they had been handling petroleum products for years, and knew all about it, the services decided that jet fuel should be a petroleum derivative of kerosene. The first fuel that they specified was JP-1, a rather narrow-cut, high-paraffinic kerosene. The oil companies pointed out that not many re. The hunting of the hypergo. 33. Fine rise in the country could produce such a product with their available equipment and crudes, and that the supply might thus be somewhat limited. So the next specification, for JP-3, JP-2 was an experimental fuel that never got anywhere, was remarkably liberal. With a wide cut, range of distillation temperatures, and with such permissive limits on olefins and aromatics that any refinery above the level of a Kentucky moonshiner's pot still could convert at least half of any crude to jet fuel. This time they went too far, allowing such a large fraction of low boiling constituents that a jet plane at high altitude boiled off a good part of its fuel. So the cut was narrowed to avoid this difficulty, but the permitted fractions of aromatics and olefins, 25 and 5 percent respectively, were not reduced. The result was JP-4, with just about the most permissive specifications to appear since the days of coal oil Johnny Rockefeller I. It is NATO standard, and the usual fuel for everything from a Boeing 707 to an F-111. JP-5 and 6 have arrived since, but haven't replaced JP-4. And RPI is another story, which will be told later. But trying to burn JP-3 or JP-4 in a rocket motor with nitric acid was a harrowing experience. In the first place, the specifications being what they were, no two barrels of it were alike. A jet engine doesn't care about the shape of the molecules it burns as long as they give up the right number of BTUs per pound, but a nitric acid rocket is fussier. It wasn't hypergolic with acid, but reacted with it to produce all sorts of tars, goos, weird colored compounds of cryptic composition. And troubles. And if you got it going using a hypergolic slug, say. Sometimes everything went well, but usually not. It was acid gasoline all over again a coughing, choking, screaming motor, that usually managed to reduce itself to fragments, and the engineers to frustrated blasphemy. Everything was tried to make the stuff burn smoothly, from catalysts in the acid down or up to voodoo. 
The farthest out expedient that I heard of was tried at Bell Aeronautic. F. Sornabadi had the bright idea that the sonic vibrations of a rocket motor might promote combustion. So he made a tape recording of the sound of a running motor and played it back at the interacting propellants in the hope that they might be shaken or shamed into smooth combustion. Why not? He tried everything else. But alas, this didn't work either. Obviously JP was a lost cause as far as the rocket business was concerned. It was with this background that the Navy's program on rocket fuels derivable from petroleum came into being in the spring of 1951, although it wasn't called that officially until the next year. If you couldn't make JP work, maybe you could derive something else. 34. Ignition. Cheaply, for choice, from petroleum that would. Or, one hoped, that could be mixed with JP and make the latter burn smoothly over a reasonable mixture ratio range. The title of the program was deceptive. Derivable is an elastic term, and it is to be doubted that the higher ups of the Bureau of Aeronautics realized what they had authorized. But the lower level chemist types in the rocket branch were perfectly aware of the fact that a good chemist, given a little time and money, can derive just about anything organic, up to RNA from petroleum if he wants to. The contractors were being told, in effect, go ahead, Max, see what you can come up with. And if it's any good, we'll find a way to make it from petroleum somehow. The contractors now joining their endeavors to those of California Research were the Shell Development Co. Standard Oil of Indiana, Phillips Petroleum, and the Chemical Engineering Department of New York University, NYU. And for the next two or three years, there was a continuous ignition delay project going on. Each laboratory, as it came up with a new hypergolic additive, would ship samples to all the others, who would mix it with standard non-hypergolic fuels and then measure the ignition delay of the mixtures. The standard non-hypergols were generally toluene and n-heptane, although NYU, presumably to assert its academic independence, used benzene and n-hexane. Yeah. JP wasn't much use as a reference fuel, since no two lots of it were alike. As for the fuels and or additives that they synthesized, Shell and NYU concentrated on acetylenic compounds, and Phillips put their major effort into amines. As for Standard of Indiana, that organization went off on a wild tangent. Apparently jealous of their sister company of California and determined to do them one better, they went beyond mere sulfur compounds and came down hard on phosphorus derivatives. They investigated assorted substituted phosphines from the trimethyl phosphine through butyl and octyl phosphines onto monochloro, dimethyl amino, phosphine. And then they settled happily on the alkyl trithiophosphides with the general formula, Rs. 3. P, where R could be methyl, ethyl, or whatever. The one they gave the greatest play was mixed alkyl trithiophosphides, which was a mixture of, mainly, the ethyl and methyl compounds. Its virtues were those of the mercaptan's hypergolicity and good density and no corrosion problems but its vices were also those of the mercaptan's exaggerated. The performance was below that of the mercaptan's, and the odor, while not as strong as those of the Pinot's creations, was utterly and indescribably vile. Furthermore, the hunting of the hypergol. 35. Their structures had an unnerving resemblance to those of the G agents, or nerve gases or of some of the insecticides which so alarmed Rachel Carlson. This disquieted was justified. When some of the alkyl theophosphites were fired at Nards, they put two rocket mechanics in the hospital, whereupon they were summarily and violently thrown off the station. Standard of Indiana plugged them hard, and there was even a conference devoted to them in March of 1953, but somehow they, like the Mercaptans, never roused the enthusiasm of the prospective users. Neither type of propellant, now, is anything but a noisome memory. The rationale behind the acetylenic work was clear enough. 
it had been shown, by Lou Rapp and Mike Pino, among others, that double and triple bonds aided hypergolic ignition, and it was reasonable to assume that they might promote smooth combustion. If only by furnishing the fuel molecule with a weak point where the oxidation might start. Furthermore, the parent molecule of the family, acetylene itself, had always been regarded hopefully by the workers in the field. The extra energy conferred upon it by the triple bond should lead to good performance, although the low percentage of hydrogen in the molecule might work against it. See the chapter on performance. But pure liquid acetylene was just too dangerous to live with. Having a lamentable tendency to detonate without warning and for no apparent reason, Perhaps some of its derivatives might be less temperamental. And these was another reason for looking at the acetylenics. A good many people, in the early 50s, were considering some unusual, not to say bizarre, propulsion cycles. Among these was the RAM rocket. This is a rocket, generally a monopropellant rocket, inside of and surrounded by a ramjet. A ramjet will not function except at high speed relative to the atmosphere, and hence has to be boosted into operation by a rocket or some other means. If the enclosed rocket of the ram rocket could get the device up to operating velocity, and if the rocket exhaust gases were combustible and could act as the fuel for the ramjet well, then you could build a cruising missile that didn't need a booster and with a lower specific fuel consumption than a straight rocket. Say that you burned propine, or methyl acetylene, in a monopropellant rocket, and that the exhaust products were largely methane and finely divided elementary carbon. Then the carbon and the methane could be burned with air in the ramjet, going IO water and carbon dioxide, and you would be making the best of both worlds. Ethylene oxide, C. 2. H. 4. O whose major decomposition products are methane and carbon monoxide, was considered for the 36. Ignition. Same sort of cycle. So the acetylenics look good for the ram rocket. And finally, the acetylenics are rather easy to produce from petroleum feedstock by cracking and partial oxidation. The approaches of NYU and of Shell to the acetylenic problem were completely dissimilar. NYU tried dozens of compounds of the family, while Shell concentrated on just two, and then went hunting for additives which would make them into useful fuels. One of the two was 1,6 heptaden, with the skeletal structure C equals OCCCC equals C. And the other was 2 methyl albutin 3 in, otherwise known as isopropanyl acetylene or methyl vinyl acetylene, whose skeleton is C. C equals C, C equals C. One source of confusion in the history of the acetylenics is the multiplicity of systems by which they were named. The first additives that they investigated thoroughly were metal derivatives of phosphorus triamide, P, N, H. 2. 3. With methyl groups substituted for from 3 to 6 of the hydrogens. They worked but so much of the additive was needed for proper ignition that it became a major component of the mixture, and even then explosive ignition was common. Then they tried the derivative of 1,3,2 dioxophosphalane. I. O. 5 CP2. 4 CO3. And finally settled on 2 dimethylamino 4 methyl 1,3,2 dioxophosphalane, which was usually and mercifully, known as reference fuel 208. Again, it wasn't a success as an additive, but taken neat, it was one of the fastest hypergols ever seen. It wasn't particularly toxic, and might have made a fairly good workhorse fuel, but before much work had been done on it, events made it obsolete. It's all but forgotten now. Between 1951 and 1955, Hapel and Marcel at NYU prepared and characterized some 50 acetylenics, hydrocarbons, alcohols, ethers, amines, and nitriles. They varied in complexity from propine, or methyl acetylene, CC equals C to such things as dimethyl diacetyl and CC. 
C equals C C equals C C equals C C equals C with no less than four multiple bonds. The climax of unsaturation came with butene dinitrile, or dicyano. The hunting of the hypergol 37. Acetylene, N equals C C equals C C equals N which had no hydrogen atoms at all, but rejoiced in the possession of three triple bonds. This was useless as a propellant it was unstable, for one thing, and its freezing point was too high but it has one claim to fame. Burning it with ozone in a laboratory experiment, Professor Gross of Temple University, who always liked living dangerously, attained a steady state temperature of some 6000 K, equal to that of the surface of the sun. Many, if not most, of the acetylenics had poor storage properties, and tended to change to tars or gels on standing. They also tended to form explosive peroxides on exposure to the atmosphere. E many of them were shock sensitive, and would decompose explosively with little or no provocation. Something like divinal diacetylene can fairly be described as an accident looking for a place to have. And while some of them were fired successfully in a rocket, RMI burned propine, methyl vinyl acetylene, methyl divinyl acetylene, and dimethyl divinyl acetylene. E, all with oxygen, they turned out not to be suitable fuels for nitric ACI. D, they usually detonated on contact with the oxidizer, as several possessors of piles of junk that had originally been ignition delay equipment could testify, and did. But some of them showed promise as monopropellants and as additives and the air reduction C. O, which had entered the field around the middle of 1953, had propine, methyl vinyl acetylene, and dimethyl divinyl acetylene in commercial production by 1955. Some of them were excellent additives for JP. 4 by August, 1953, RMI had shown that as little as 10% of methyl vinyl acetylene in JP4 led to smooth combustion with RFNA over a wide range of mixture ratios, and greatly improved ignitio. And if a hypergolic slug was used, transition to the working fuel was smooth and without incident, and, for that matter, ignition could easily be achieved with a powder squib, and without a starting slug at all. L several of the others had the same effect, but by the time that this was determined the acetylenics had been overtaken by history, and had been developed only to be abandoned. Homer Fox and Howard Bost ran the amine program at Phillips Petroleum. M the relationship of amines to petroleum is exiguous at best, but they had been used as fuels for some time, triethylamine had been used in the Tonkas, and Lugku. D although they had never been examined systematically for propellant use. This Phillips proceeded to do, and investigated amines in infinite variety. Why primary, secondary, and tertiary amines? Saturated and unsaturated amines, allyl, and prop argyl amines. Monoamines, diamines, even triamines, and tetramines. They must have synthesized and characterized at least. 38. Ignition. 40 aliphatic amines, including a few with other functional groups. O groups and ether linkages. They concentrated on the tertiary polyamines. This was logical enough. They knew that tertiary amines were generally hypergolic with nitric acid, and it was reasonable to think that a D or tri tertiary amine might be more so. Their guess turned out to be right but one is reminded of E.T. Bell's remark that the great vice of the Greeks was not sodomy but extrapolation. The compounds they investigated ranged from 1,2 bis, dimethylamino, ethane, up to such curiosities as 1,2,3, tris, dimethylamino, propane and tetrakis, dimethylaminomethyl, methane, which can be visualized as a neopentane molecule with a dimethylamine group on each corner. Incidentally, it turned out to have an unacceptably high freezing point, which, considering the symmetry of the molecule, might have been expected. One is led to suspect that some of the fancier amines were synthesized, not because there was any reason to believe that they would be an improvement on the ones they already had. 
but to demonstrate the virtuosity of the benchman, who wanted to prove that he could do it. The tertiary diamines were the ones that really got a workout. Just about every possible structural change, and its consequences, were investigated. Thus they investigated the consequences of varying the terminal groups, as in the series. 1,2 bis, dimethyl, or ethyl, or allylamino, ethane. Or, of varying the length of the central hydrocarbon chain, as in. 1, 1,1, 1,2, 1,3, 1,4, 1,6. Bis, dimethyl amino. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, hexane. They moved the amino groups around, as in 1, 2. J bis, dimethyl amino, propane and 1, 21, 1, 3 J bis, dimethyl amino, butane. 1, 4. They examined the effect of unsaturation in series like butane 1, 4 bis, dimethyl amino, 2 butene. Point 2 butene. The hunting of the hypergol. 39. And they tried every conceivable permutation and combination of these changes, as well as adding O groups or ether linkages. As might have been expected, introducing an hydroxyl group produced a compound which was excessively viscous at low temperatures. Triethanolamine, which had been considered as a fuel, is an extreme example of this effect, and therefore was never used. The allyl terminated amines were also rather viscous, and were subject to atmospheric oxidation. Otherwise, as might have been expected, they were all very much alike, the complicated ones being in no way superior to the simple compounds, as might also have been expected. None of them was any good as a jet fuel additive. They neither improved combustion nor, except in overwhelming proportions, made the jet fuel hypergolic. However, they looked promising as straight fuels, and Phillips ship. A hypergolic propellant combination used in a rocket engine is one whose components spontaneously ignite when they come into contact with each other. Hmm. However, they looked promising as straight fuels, and Phillips shipped samples of four of them to the Wright Air Development Center to be test fired. They were all of the bis, dimethyl amino, type, the 1,2 ethane, the 1,2 and 1,3 propane, and the 1,3-1 butene, at WADC, in 1956, Jack Gordon checked out their properties and logistics, and fired them with RFNA. They were good fuels. Ignition was hypergolic and fast, combustion was good and performance was respectable, and the saturated ones, at least, were quite stable to heat and suitable for regenerative cooling. And they, too, were obsolete at birth. For all this work had been done, as it were, with the left hand. Hydrazine was the name of the big game. 